Welcome, Michelle Ray. Thank you so much for joining me on the Wholesome Crypto Podcast. I appreciate you taking that time out to speak with me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're a huge influence in the crypto industry and the Bitcoin industry too. Um, I would love to learn everything that you're doing now in this industry. But before we get into that, I would love to learn, you know, before you even heard about Bitcoin, where were you in life? What were you doing? Uh, so long ago and far away in a previous life, I was actually working mostly in marketing and media uh, in politics. Politics, nice. It's a tough industry. Yeah, no, it wasn't nice, <laughs> it's <not> nice. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hectic. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. It was uh, about fifteen years of um, just doing marketing mm -hmm. and media and campaigning, um, both for um, you know politicians and for specific policies that that I was interested in. Uh, I was, um, you know, very often the lone libertarian mm -hmm. voice in um some more what would mostly be con you know considered conservative campaigns although i did work for uh, issues in particular on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. but uh you know there comes a time when you start to realize that that what you're doing isn't as effective as you hoped it yeah, would be it's a different game with um, politics you're kind of just playing versus actually yeah. accomplishing anything right you know and, and if you get in it because of for ideological yep. reasons you can only you can only you know go so exactly. far. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of being active in politics, um, especially at the local level, particularly at the local level. Um, you know, the, the the government that governs least is the mm -hmm. best, and you have a lot more control over local politics than you do national. But um, with crypto, uh, and a little before that, I think I started to realize that it wasn't there were ways to, to, to accomplish what I wanted without having to get a lawmaker's permission. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Like we've, I, everyone that agrees on this is decentralization and being able to give permissionless access to build together as a community. Everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything. Absolutely. Everything. Um, you know, one of the things about politics that, that I always disdained was um, the division of political parties and, and sort of these concrete solidified stances that these political parties take uh, in terms of messaging. And, and after a while, when you spend a lot of time in politics, you realize politicians themselves are exactly yeah, the same. All sides. Um, doesn't matter what's going <laughs> yep. in the aisle. Right. right. But the, the way you solve problems has nothing to do with aligning with a, an ideology uh, permanently or a party or, or even a politician. Um, I may align with somebody who otherwise I, I wouldn't agree on on one policy issue uh, and be completely opposed to them on another policy mm -hmm. issue. And so for me, it just became more and more clear that permanent alliances are not how you solve any problem at all. Um, and, and that building communities with the intent of solving a problem yep. is actually far more gratifying. Yeah, and everything's... Than, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say then, then out there shouting on behalf of, of some political ideology or party. Exactly. Or and things are always changing with time too. Nothing stays the same. Nothing yeah. stays permanent. And you have to be able to evolve yourself and change your ideas if it's what you agree with and your own ideology. Right. And I, I think that in crypto in mm -hmm. particular, it was you know one of the best examples of, of challenging that as things are, as they've always been, isn't necessarily how they should yep. be. Um, and so even if you hold a strong um, philosophical belief about, you know, any one ideology, that doesn't mean the solutions that have been presented in the past are the right ones to get yep. you there. And so, uh, you know, for me, it, it, there just came a time when I realized I was far more interested in working for solutions to the problems that I specifically was passionate about than I was trying to promote people who said they have the answers and never did anything about them. And so now that you're working heavily in uh, media, marketing, and politics, you were you always, before even like, you know, again, hearing about Bitcoin, were you always into tech heavily? It was like new technology. I guess it was something you used because of marketing. It's something you had to keep learning and well, adopting. Well, actually, it was kind of the opposite. Really? I got into marketing because I was already into technology. Mm. So I, I grew up... Um, I grew up 
you know, kind of always had the latest gadgets in the house. And and my father is very, very technical. Um, I was, my career, my actual professional career long ago began in, in a software company. Um, so I kind of went to college and got out of college about the time that, that, software development companies were starting to grow and, you know, kind of be this, this central, you know, there really wasn't a computer science major at mm-hmm. that time. Yeah. It was just developing, but home computing was, was starting to become um, a little more ubiquitous. Um, people were more familiar with home computing software companies that were outsourced to develop solutions were now this whole new employment opportunity. And so kind of uh, my first real job out of college was, was with a software company. And while I, I, I wasn't a developer, I didn't know any code at the time. I was very, very comfortable. Yeah. In you could space. speak the language. And so, like- yeah, you know, and, and it, you know, I, I worked in kind of a a human resources role in a software company and um, it just kind of went from there. I actually stayed in, in those kinds of roles, not human resources, but more in, um, you know, like support technical support Mm -hmm. roles. As I, as I learned, I never went to school for computers. You don't even need to. That's, this is such a self-taught industry Absolutely i learned everything not. on my Absolutely. own too i went for school for electrical yeah. engineering but i came out of it because of youtube <laughs> yeah I, I went to school for finance um which has been very very mm-hmm. helpful um not that i've used it practically in a career sense but it's been you know this huge supplement when it tra- when it comes to explaining my passion for crypto and, and prior to that politics but i did i worked in technology um up until about 2008 but my background um, in technology made me an early adopter of a lot of, of technologies. Uh, I, you know, I had cell phones early. I worked for a cell phone company. I worked for mm-hmm. a pager company when pagers were thing. Yeah. You know, those little I, things used to go. I remember this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I, I worked for, like I said, I worked support for a cell phone company. I did point of sale installations. And so I worked uh, RMA mm-hmm. for you know, one of the biggest motherboard companies in the world. I worked in, uh, ran an RMA department there. Um, and then I, I got in when online buying became a thing. I, I worked with a company that wrote software that supported a, a lot of stores. Like back yep. in the day, we supported buy.com. Oh, yeah, I remember um, those guys too. Wow. Was, yeah. yeah, so I, I kind of just stuck with software for a long time. And then there was this intermediate period in my life where – you know, I was, I have, uh, I have four children and, um, you know, I had them at home and I wanted to be with them mm-hmm. at home and software for me had kind of gotten stagnant actually. Um, so this is right about the time we've got Twitter, we've got uh, Facebook, okay. they're just coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, they're really just starting to get super popular. So, we're, you know, we're talking 2007, yeah. 2008, 2009, um, and I, I so kind of in my head, I feel like we reached this plateau of um, innovation or innov- not, not necessarily just innovation, but but what the average person was going to be involved with in computing. So we gotcha. had this this growing entertainment sector when it came to software. We had this growing solution sector when it came to business software. Um, and we weren't innovating so much as improving on things at a very fast yeah. rate. And it was, you know, it was great, but there was nothing new and exciting for me. Social media kind of changed that for me. Um, I actually got into politics because I was super active on social media. I was very vocal. Twitter gave me a place to meet people that, you know, across the country that that were like-minded, Facebook and Twitter. Um, we had long, you know, really in-depth conversations about politics and policy and, and lifestyles and philosophy. And, and, you know, it kind of gave you that opportunity to meet people that you wouldn't normally have yeah. run across. And it also gave you back, you know, back then the opportunity to have, uh, you know, really honest debates you know, prior to, you know, I'm going back to 2009, 2010, you could talk to people who were, uh, you know, considered themselves in a different political space than you and have actual yep. conversations. Um, you know, that, that 
that's not so much the case no. anymore. But that's a very exciting time. And for me, um, watching the Arab Spring on Vold Live on Twitter was really, I had been using Twitter for marketing. I had a small at-home business. Um, I had been using it for marketing mm -hmm. in that case. And, and I, one of the early, early stages of online marketing, <clears throat> excuse me, where you would be on a message board, you know, um, with minded people and you had something to sell and you could put a little tagline in your signature <laughs> on a message yeah. board or whatever. So that, you know, really dating myself. That I was use kind those of too. My first, my, right, your, my first realization that online marketing was going to be massive. And so at the time I was able to kind of marry that experience and uh, my fascination for watching social media grow with being able to reach like-minded people or people who were on the fence about some ideas that I had yeah. um, and work on my, the powers of persuasion, which is really all marketing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, love that because that's like, that's the best part about the internet and like Twitter and those, especially with forums back in the day, those public forums where you can just join a different discussion yeah. group or discussion forum and talk about what you like and learn about what other people are saying, read their threads. It's like that whole I feel like the whole scene has really faded away and really has been consumed by Twitter and Facebook. There isn't special designated yeah. websites where you can go into more of a community of what you're into. Cause for me, like it was all about like tech, um, different types of like, uh, school, uh, subjects like math and sciences are actually a lot of helpful yeah. forms and like politics and, and other such. So it's awesome that you were, yeah, I miss, I actually kind of miss, so the birth of blogging, mm -hmm. even long form blogging, where people would just throw their thoughts and yeah. ideas out there and you, you were able to get this new perspective on any topic you could possibly imagine. I mean, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just ideas, but it was mm -hmm. education. Now, I think in some ways we've, we've, you know, so dramatically improved on access to information yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the information we're accessing isn't always, it's more about being first or being right Loudest. Uh, ideologically yeah. as opposed to factually. Um, I think that, that the idea that spawned social media as a, as a service online, uh, doesn't exist anymore. That whole bringing together, you know, that coffee shop of conversation yeah. ideas or whatever. Uh, I think we're, we're, you know, we've reinvented tribalism mm. in a new venue yeah. uh, which is which is kind of sad because i used to love uh you know i would love to read differing opinions uh whether i i eventually came to change my mind or i used them to sharpen my own yeah. arguments they were exactly useful. it's always good to hear the different um, side of the story just just an educational right. terms just it's good to listen it's always good to keep an open perspective and and i think we've also kind of gotten away from um you know, kind of the internet for mm -hmm. good, which I think was, a, you know, a ubiquitous idea from, from the, you know, cyberpunks and the people who were bringing internet to the everyday people um, and bringing it into homes and then trying to make it useful um, and educational yeah. and, and social. I think we've gotten away from that. Uh, and it's really, it, it really has become a tool for tribalism. So, uh how, um, at this, sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, so at this point, where um, when you were in those forums, you were like, again, uh, you're talking about uh, cypherpunks and listening to them and seeing what they're working on. Was it at around this time when you like started seeing Bitcoin pop up? Did you did you hear someone talk about it and kind of brushed it off, like whatever? And then you kept no, kept no, coming no, up. Actually, it was. It was the opposite. I was, I've always been hugely interested in, in finance and in, in global finance mm -hmm. in particular. Um, everything from investing to MMT, uh, you know, to how money is moved. Um, just kind of, a, a, just kind of a fascination. I've always had money makes the world yeah. go round kind of thing. Um, and so I had heard about Eagle. Oh yeah. Way long before I, I ever heard of, of anything about Bitcoin and it was fascinating uh, and then, of course, I followed the case of the Liberty mm -hmm. Dollar um, and was outraged, of course. Um, but no, my expression of Bitcoin was very, very, uh, very timely. I was starting to become very disillusioned with working in politics. Um, 
not so much because I didn't have a lot of success in, in, in furthering my ideas, but because the the people I were working with were working in politics and not working on policy, gotcha. um, which are very, very different things. And just um, as it happens, my father is a, is a kind of a finance guy and a big geek. And one day I happened to be, I happened to be home visiting for Christmas. Mm-hmm. We were sitting in two different rooms and on Yahoo <laughs> messenger, I think he sent me this message and he's like, Hey, check this out. And he sent me a link to the Bitcoin white paper. Wow. Um, so I want to say, I want to say this was December of 2011. Okay. Um, you know, he would, that would, that was, that would have been about the time. So around Christmas of 2011, uh, of course the Bitcoin white paper is nine pages and, uh, it didn't take me long to read, but a lot of it was over my head, but I didn't need to get too far past the first paragraph to understand what I was reading. And after reading it, uh, got online, hit some forums, hit some message boards, discovered where I could download Bitcoin Core. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I did that, um, spent the next two days waiting patiently for it to sink. (laughs) Good times, right? Yeah, that was a long time. Uh, Spent the next three or four days trying to find somebody on the message board and a way for me to get Mm -hmm. some Bitcoin. Um. I didn't, you know, I didn't buy a lot, like 40 bucks worth but at the time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, so Bitcoin Core, of course, was on that hard drive. And then I went home after the Christmas holiday and promptly forgot about the Bitcoin that was on the hard drive. Uh, I was working. I had four kids. Yeah, it's, it's you know, and, and, yeah and it, it was just, you know, I was still in politics at the time, very busy season in 2012, at late 2011, 2012. And I forgot about it for about six or eight months. And then I ran across an article and I was like, oh yeah, that. yeah, I need to look more into that Bitcoin stuff. Did a little more digging, called my dad and said, hey, can you send me the hard drive out of that laptop or out of that desktop? And he was like, oh no, no, I wiped it. Ah, uh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, it's so many stories just like that. It's just, you don't, you, you don't know, yeah. you, don't, you can't predict that. Well, yeah, and for me, especially at the time, it wasn't even about yeah. price, right? I I was so enamored. I mean, my jaw basically hit the floor when I read the mm-hmm. white paper. I was in love, wholly devoted. Um, I was so fascinated with what was being proposed and, and what the, the scale on which it was being proposed. Uh, if you know, for people who haven't read the Bitcoin white paper, it, it, it's it's a tech paper, but it's written in a very nonchalant mm-hmm. voice. Like this is just the way things should be. Yeah, I love reading it too. Um, it's just like a, it's like calming almost. Like this, this is how we solve the problem of double spending. How we solve inflation. This is, this is what's wrong with this money. Is this is how we can use uh, yeah. technology to solve it. Yeah, and and for me, once I got back into it, so I'm going to say this is probably around August of 2012. I was getting more and more. Uh, in back into Bitcoin and um, trying to find ways to to get back into it, and, and even then for me it was about practical mm-hmm. use. So, um, and, and I'm sure we'll get here. You know, it's very exciting to watch crypto markets now. Um, it's very very exciting, but there was no crypto no. market back then. Really, uh, it was very very tiny community, global but tiny, and um, Price movements were at first slow, then fast, then slow, then slow, then slow. <laughs> uh, and so for me, but it was never about, do I want more fiat? Yeah. Like that was the opposite of what it was for me. And uh, so I started preaching about Bitcoin on Twitter to my political followers, uh, to my friends, to my neighbors. Um, and I did this fruitlessly for a year at least. And then um yeah, this is big shout out to edge mm-hmm. wallet uh, uh the ceo of edge wallet reached out to me on twitter and he said um hey would you be interested in helping doing a little marketing for a bitcoin wallet uh back then they were Airbits. Okay. and uh yeah so sent me an sdk and uh, they had some really practical features that I loved back then because they were practical to me. Um, they had a, at the time they had this really great directory 
it was sparsely populated, but it was a directory of places that accepted Bitcoin around the world. Oh, they had that back um, then? Wow, I didn't even... They, yeah, so this is 2014. They launched with okay. that in uh, October of 2014. And uh, for me, you know, and, and it was probably that exposure to Edge. So Edge at Airbits at the time is dedicated to sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, there's no KYC to have an Edge account. Uh, they have, you don't need to sign up with your name, your phone number, none of that stuff. Um, it was completely anonymous. They were offering this directory, which is a practical use case for crypto. And at the time, uh, I think it was Bitcoin, um, and Litecoin maybe okay. is what came in the wallet. Uh, or may, actually no, at the time they were just Bitcoin started going to meetups with them. Um, and then later without them. Uh, I was getting paid. In ah, that's awesome. That's like a dream still for me. I'm trying to get paid in crypto. <laughs> right. So, and this was long before there were services like BitPay or BitWage yeah. um, where you could just take your fiat and have it turned into Bitcoin. I was genuinely solving problems. I was finding coffee shops that would accept Bitcoin and pizza places. And I was invoicing in the equivalent of US dollars and I was getting Bitcoin deposited into my wallet. And for me, that was, that was, that cool. was the dream, yeah. right? These were practical use yeah. cases. Um, and so I didn't have to worry about the fiat thing. And then those kinds of opportunities kept coming. So another big shout out to cheap air. They, um, you know, I, I started using cheap air to buy. Clean I remember when that news came out, I was like, oh, I have to check this out. Yeah, no, I, I would like to tell you how much, you know, those plane flights are worth today, but you know, I, you know, I bought flights and then overstock started mm -hmm. accepting Bitcoin. And so I sit on a very, very expensive couch at home. And, um, then there were things like purse where yep. you, now you could spend your fiat and, and get Bitcoin for it. Um, all of these incredible things early on, very early on Fold. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fold. Um, not with um, Fold. Fold app. Yeah, no, they're like one of my absolute favorite projects. Back then, Fold was an online app where you could send in Bitcoin and you got Starbucks gift cards. Wow. That's all it was. You got coffee. Um, and then there were places like menu.com that let you order from multiple restaurants. Uh, and, and they took Bitcoin. They accepted Bitcoin. Or and Litecoin back then, I think um, they accept many. They still accept many cryptos, you know. If you did so, for me, it was that cycle of uh, you know working with Edge part time, Airbits, then later they became Edge, getting paid in crypto, being able to actually buy things in crypto, um, finding opportunities where if I couldn't pay in crypto, I could find somebody who was willing to take my crypto and pay dollars for me. That for me was the dream. Mm -hmm. It was never about more fiat, which is probably a good thing because if I go back through my my wallets and look at my what it cost me then versus what it's worth now, it's a you know I would I would if, if that was my my concern is the the fiat yeah. gains, I would probably be heartbroken. It, but but that's the thing, you're right. It's not about the fiat gains. Everyone is so yeah. focused on that. It's about like gaining the a freedom to use money how you see fit and your own method and right. owning your money and not worrying about it's right. um how it came to existence um and it's also i think people always forget like i'm very like st i believe in spending your bitcoin to like buy things just because it helps the general economy with diversifying um value instead of just hodling everything there's right. No one's getting anything from it other than more fiat value. But well, and that's that's interesting too. So there was a long period of time where I like I said, I did exactly that. I rented cars and bought plane tickets and, and coffee and pizza and whatever. Um and then there was a period of time when the market itself became the mm -hmm. news. So I, you know, I've skipped over this big part of time when the news was Mount Gox and Crypsy yeah. and Silk Road, um, which was very disheartening. The media grabbed a hold, of course, of of the, the headlines that were going to sell and not the excitement that I had, which was this revolutionary global way to, to 
I mean, empower the bankless and invest in companies you couldn't normally invest in, um, you know, help people in emerging economies, uh, deal with oppression, um, buy things, you know, instantly, you know, no waiting for PayPal, no waiting for wire transfers, no waiting for your bank transfers um, to confirm your existence. Like, right. No third party in between me and this person I want to do business with, whatever that yeah. business may be. Um, and so seeing, and of course, that's the difficult thing to explain to people. And that has actually gotten harder for me because the first thing they think of is the, the fiat mm-hmm. value. You know, oh, well, it's at, it's, at, it's at a top. Why would I buy it now? Um, or it just crashed. Nobody, you know, why would I buy it now? Nobody accepts Bitcoin. Everybody accepts yep. Bitcoin. You just have to it's, get them to accept Bitcoin. Um, yeah, so that was that was really hard for me. And that's actually gotten harder because people now look at Bitcoin because now you've got um, Forbes crypto and Yahoo crypto and NASDAQ mm-hmm. and they're all running tickers and they're running futures tickers and EFT tickers and they're running, uh, you know, the Bitcoin to USD valuation and I'm thinking like the USD valuation is the least important use case for Thank you. Yes. Bitcoin or any other. Yes, concept. exactly. It's, it's, a, it's almost sad seeing how much people focus on that. I'm like, this is supposed to create freedom. Like back in like 2011, 2012, when people first talked about blockchain technology, everyone was on board, even like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Purecoin, all those uh, coins mm-hmm. that were coming out. They're all on the same page with creating some type of financial freedom in terms of you owning your asset and you being able to transact with people anywhere around the world cheap and without any KYC, without any third party people trying to get in the way, just like me right. doing business yeah, free, I mean. freely. And um, it hasn't, it's not like that anymore. It's um, all I see on Twitter is look at the price pump, look at the price dump, it's a red candle, it's green candles. So I'm like, right. ah, please just. And, and, you know, and it's, it's from now. So if I go back to my marketing mm-hmm. roots or my, you know, my marketing experience, you have to have a hook to get people interested. And, and in my mind, um, people have made a mistake of using the price as a hook it's, because it's very, very difficult as it is to talk people out of the U S dollar box or this you know, Swiss franc box mm-hmm. or, or, you know, whatever, uh, or the yuan box or the yen box, it's very difficult to talk them out of that box into something that they just never fathomed before, um, especially when you keep harping on the price. Yep. But you do need a hook. And um, it, just as a perfect example, I introduced a friend um, on Twitter to Bitcoin and we fought endlessly about the US is going to ban it yeah. and it has no practical use case. And finally talked him into downloading the wallet and let me send you five dollars worth of Bitcoin. And now, you know, now obviously this is, you know, five years later and his viewpoint has changed. Not that he doesn't still see some fiat investment value in Bitcoin or some um, maintaining your wealth, yeah. right? A store of wealth, a store of value in Bitcoin, but also these these other possibilities. And for me, you know, being passionate about freedom and sovereignty and independence and solving problems, Bitcoin for me was always like, look, you, you could make some fiat gains if you're lucky. And that's really what it is. You're spinning a roulette wheel for the most part. Um, but what you also could do is empower a business, mm-hmm. become a part of a business that you truly believe in, um, you know, whether it's in your hometown or whether it's in, you know, Belarus or, or, or whether it's in Estonia yeah. uh, or Iran or Cuba. And you can be a part of these emerging economies with no one to stop you from being a founder in another part of the world. I always, I always um, ask uh, small companies around my area, like if I go like for a haircut or something and ask, do you take Bitcoin? Do you yeah, and they're like, oh, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. It's too volatile. I don't know about the taxes. I don't know if the government's going to come after me for accepting Bitcoin. I'm like, well, you can easily avoid all that if you're really worried about the fiat problem because you can convert it immediately yeah. and also report it as that. But it's just such a, the media has driven it into something to be afraid of because of the way they labeled it and because of the way they present it as something that Right. I mean, the headlines are about hacks or the headlines are, right, are about super, major yeah. volatility. 
Um, and yeah, I agree. That's tragic. I, you know, I did the same thing for years and years and, and I still do it. So my dentist accepts Bitcoin and he's got a Bitcoin ATM. Um, and then my uh, ophthalmologist, mm-hmm. their office now has a Bitcoin that's ATM, awesome. um, which is great. Bitcoin ATM is popping up everywhere. I thought was amazing, but now most of them can yeah. see. Uh, so, which I find truly it's back truly to square tragic. one. And, uh, yeah, and, and it, that's this is hard for me too because um, I work, I work in a in a you know a company now that that offers centralized services mm-hmm. as well as decentralized services. And uh, the reality is, not everybody is as comfortable taking risks. So, on the adoption curve for for Bitcoin, crypto, Filecoin you know, Ethereum, whatever, we're still, you know, I, I don't think we're past the, we're still in a very, very early adopter mm-hmm. stage. Um, I think that the saddest thing for me is to get past that, we have to um, convince people that, that there's a place for crypto in their lives beyond um can I make a few fiat dollars as pretending I'm a day trader? So what is, uh, you're talking about creating a hook. So what would be your hook to nab somebody to like show them what Bitcoin really is? So this is great. I, I, I'm able to use my personal experience as a hook. As I, as I mentioned, I've got four mm-hmm. kids, um, three of them getting ready to, to go into college. So I, I have one that just started nice. college uh, this past fall and then two more on the way. And if I am looking to maintain the value of their, their college funds and to provide them with a liquid asset that, that you know, I can send them off into life with, for me, that has been crypto. It's easy to store. Mm-hmm. It's, it's becoming more and more liquid. Um, and now it doesn't even have to be liquid in order for you to be able to use it in, in the real world, whether you're actually spending Bitcoin or you have this, this, you know, middleman conversion that's happening. Um, now you can get, you know, crypto back credit cards, crypto back loans. Uh, there are interest accounts yep. out there um, that pay actually in crypto and not in fiat. I think for me, the hook is I'm a woman, I'm a mother, women run the budgets of most households. Yep. And, and if you tell women this thing is is a currency for sure, it, it can be spent as a currency. And if you stop relying on the US dollar, um, you'll find that you can get a lot more value out of actually spending your Bitcoin. But it takes a while to get them there, right? But if you tell them that initially this is a store of value that more and more companies are realizing they can leverage and so they're willing to let to hold on to your crypto for mm-hmm. you and give you this fiat you need to transact while you're still growing the value of this crypto. You know, you tell a lot of women that the purchasing power of the dollar is dropping by 30% yep. in the last year and a half. But the value of their crypto has gone up 100% in the last year and a half. Um, that makes a big difference to people who are, are planning for futures, retirements, sending kids to college, major purchases. Um, and and the, the behavior that is needed to do that is no different than the behavior you do for any other savings plan. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to convince people to buy Lambos and change their name to <laughs> Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like that's... that's not- I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid to tell you I'm in my late forties. I'm a mom of four. I'd like to retire one day. For me, the promise of crypto is freedom and control over that freedom. But the way I make that happen is exactly the same way I would as if I was doing it with stocks or bonds or an IRA or a 401k, a dollar cost average, my purchases. I don't look for short-term gains. I recognize um, I've done the vetting. I mean, Bitcoin for me is a very well vetted project at mm-hmm. this point. Um, and just as I would invest in any other company, not a, not huge into altcoins. Uh, I own a few, very few, but not not because I have altcoin fever, but because I believe in the teams that are behind it, what they what they're building. Same as I would as as if I had bought you know Amazon or Tesla ten years yeah. ago, five years. Ago. Makes sense, and um. 
Yeah. So you're also talking about how you, know, you have four kids, you're uh, working on your, on your company and crypto is a 24 seven industry. What, what do you, like, how do you find time for yourself to, I guess, I don't know. Some people feel like personally, I'm like, I need to step away from this crypto scene for a bit and just kind of take yeah. care of myself. But I'm wondering, how do you find time to take care of Michelle? Well, so amazingly, we live in this incredible time when I can do everything I need to do to be a part of this, this amazing crypto movement right from my yeah. couch. Um, and I think one of the, one of the positive things about, you know, kind of everybody having these devices in their hands, in their pockets is that I can, I can be responsive. I can take my work. I can be creative. I can be effective from anywhere mm -hmm. on the planet. Um, and, uh, I think there's also a mindset that has changed, you know, kind of clocking in at 9am clocking out at 5pm, totally especially in this space. Yeah. It just doesn't exist. Um, I've been extremely blessed and grateful to have worked with companies who uh, believe, as I believe, that if you put in the work, um, you know, and you you figure out what's important to you, that you know they give you that time and that space and that opportunity to do that. And so, uh, for the last ten years, actually, I've been very very lucky to to be able to, to step away for a while and go hang out with the kids awesome. or, you know, go, go to an event with them. I am. Um, and I think that's, that's something amazing, not just about the, the developer space. One of the things that excites me so much about any crypto project now is it's no longer developers trying to convince the world that their product yep. is good. They have entire teams. Um, and this is such an amazing space to get into if you're a marketer, if you're a writer, if you're an accountant, if you're a controller, um, you know, if you're a lawyer, it, it you really, so much. the space is so massive. Um, and if you're looking for a way to change your life, to, to bring that kind of a freedom of being able to work from anywhere and meet people everywhere, work in a global environment, crypto really has a space for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was work. I've been working from home exclusively since 2011. Oh. So even before I, I, I got into crypto full time, but to me, this kind of freedom, you know, this kind of be able to go anywhere in the globe and, and find my people, um, find people who are into this space, excited about the space, have more opportunities in mm -hmm. this space. I mean, you, if you, if you even look into crypto, you, you trip over opportunities for full-time jobs, part-time jobs to dip your toes in or dive full in. You don't have to be rich to be a founder. You don't even need VCs to be a founder anymore of a crypto company. Yeah. And it's such a like, global, uh, such a global industry too. So anyone, uh, anyone can apply to any job in any country almost, but like, it's pretty right. amazing how right. much it's it amazing. makes me feel like the world's actually getting smaller. Everyone's talking to everyone. Everyone's sharing finances. Everyone else, everyone's, learning the same ideology of yeah. let's work together on this new uh let's solve some yeah problems. this new technology is going to help let's fix <laughs> i love it right yeah and for me so that was the dramatic shift right i'm in politics and it's becoming more and more divisive and and more and more about grabbing money and grabbing headlines and it, it, it's really about driving wedges and then i dive i i really quit i quit politics um in 2016 and went into crypto mm -hmm. full-time and uh, it's literally like doing a 180. I'm in this incredibly inclusive community whose entire goal is to create excitement and solve problems. Um, I mean, yeah, there are there are rivalries between altcoins or whatever, but if you're seriously invested in solving a problem or creating something that's you know just completely mm -hmm. new. This space is full of those people all over the world, yep. and it, you know, and it is an amazingly different experience from being involved in such a, a divisive, you know, rest of the, and the you world. Can tell. Right, I, I'm barely on social media anymore, not because uh, I couldn't enjoy the crypto space on social media. I certainly could, but I'm too busy building <laughs> things. I'm too busy making things and happen, which is amazing. You can tell which products are also the ones that are actually trying to solve a problem versus the ones that are just 
trying to capitalize. Yep. Trying to pump their own coin. Like, oh yeah, we're totally gonna make it. Like you're not you're not talking anything other than your price. So it's it's important to scope right. those out. And and like as it gets bigger, it is harder to tell which one is which just because if you're new to the industry, you kind of like don't know what to look out for. But I think people like you, people like us, just like trying yeah. to educate people on how you should look at a a specific cryptocurrency project and what you should be looking for and what really aligns with your own values is what you should be working into. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and that's something else too. I, I try to divide myself from people who are investing. Mm -hmm. I think there are investors who are investing because they see a massive opportunity for, for generating and storing wealth, uh, not in terms of fiat, but just in general. Um, but also those people who are supporting communities. And then there are people who just in and out, you know, how can I get in early? Can I ride the hype wave? Can I get out with, with a little fiat and move on to the next thing? Um, I, I look at crypto, not just Bitcoin, but crypto as an economy, right? We need savers. We need spenders. We need investors. We need, um, you know, people who are, are churning money back into to the development of these projects. Um, and so I try not to hold it against day traders or, or whatever, or crypto bros <laughs> or whatever. I just, I try not, I try not not hold it against them because, you know, by the same token, the internet, you know, it's a tired kind of thing, but it never gets, it, it never goes, it becomes less effective. We're still the, we're still the internet, in, you know, 2001. We're still learning. Uh, and yeah, you've got to get out there and you've got to pump these projects and you've got to put money into them to see where they'll go. And I've watched, you know, over the last seven, eight years, I've watched these, these, uh, you know, I, I remember Ethereum coming yeah. out and I remember having this long conversation with a friend of mine going, look, Ethereum is not Bitcoin. It's not meant to be a currency. It's meant to be something else. And then, of course, now people are trading either. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm like, okay, yeah, you can trade either just like you can trade coffee or pork futures or whatever, but that's not the purpose of pork or coffee, right? I could, I could trade these futures, but it, it has a practical use. And so that's getting more and more difficult to have those conversations to kind of glean out what problems all of these projects are solving. Um, NFT, the <laughs> NFT yeah. hype for me. Yeah, I did. I did. I actually did a podcast a couple of months ago. I'm super excited about NFTs, um, but not for what they're being. No, used definitely for not for now because right now it's just look how much money I have. This picture that I have is worth. I'm right. like, ah, come on, not again with the money. NFTs yeah. are a great source right, right, yeah. to like check out this awesome NFT I just paid two point four no. million dollars for, and I'm like. I right clicked and saved it. So. <laughs> well, it's important to show like NFTs well, are awesome because it gives you like, oh, I actually own this thing. It's a great proof of like ownership or like creation. It's great for artists who really right. need it. And like, right. um, uh, and so when it replaces the copyright mm -hmm. system, when it replaces the um, deed system for property, that's, when it replaces that's what it's real use cases for, exactly. Right, right. You know, when you're able to transfer property and and the ownership of, of this is represented. I always thought, I think there was a guy who sold his house as an NFT. And I always thought that was the perfect first mm -hmm. use case. I can create an NFT that is a, a video walkthrough of this house I have for sale. And buying that NFT, it, it transfers the deed. That's That, that makes house. sense. Right. And then you can do that same thing with any real property or any IP or, you know, you just, you have to encode this. And for me, NFTs don't also have to have to be sold. They can, you know, I can have, um, I can have an image of a medical file in which is encoded my entire medical record. And now my medical yes. record is an NFT convertible, you know, conferable to a, a physician's office or a medical group by a private part, you know, a private public key pair. That I can revoke. Yes, at thank time, you. That's a, right? thank you. Yes, <laughs> right. There are so many amazing use cases for this type of encryption, and um, and really this encryption system, uh, and and how it's represented. So for me, the the excitement of NFTs is a visual or an audio representation of something that I want to confer to somebody else permanently and have a record mm -hmm. of that, and. and when we can we can lock those NFTs up, access to those NFTs with something like a private public key pair that 
expires or never expires, um, that that get, gets really exciting for me. Um, I hear I'm going to throw an idea out there. Like, I like the art NFTs. Um, I like the idea of having this gallery of um, up and coming mm -hmm. artists that I enjoy. Uh, I think the the best thing that could happen now to NFTs is for somebody to create a Roku app <laughs> where I can display my NFTs. Yeah, in the gallery, I think that's right? a digital world for us. You know, the, the VR world right, is going right. to become. Like, it's fine that my art is hmm. digital, right? But I'm not. I'm not going to pay. <laughs> I'm not going to give you 40 ether for something I can break. I know, say. but um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's good if it's um, something you can own as a physical asset. But I mean, it's like one of those, you have to generate buzz somehow. And what generates buzz yeah, more absolutely. than what's something valued. So I guess. And, and, and culture leads practicality. It yeah. always has, right? Life imitates art. And all so that now that brings stuff. me to my next question. What is your crypto pet peeve? Oh, well, I yeah. think I'd probably answer that a hundred times over right now, assuming that the value of crypto is denominated in USD or franc or yuan or yen, <laughs> and, and it really is not. That might be your your immediate solvency or liquidity, but that's not the value of, yeah. of you know, if somebody says, you know, a Bitcoin is worth $47,000 <laughs> now, a Bitcoin is worth a uh, I, It's exactly true. And what, yeah, it's, that's kind of what I always like joke about sometimes on Twitter. I'm like, People say, what's the value of Bitcoin? What do you expect it to be? I'm like, oh, one Bitcoin. <laughs> That's Yeah, it's one Bitcoin. Uh, I always. definitely looked at your Twitter too for a while. And I saw that you also uh, talk yeah. about bourbon a lot. So while I have you here, what is your favorite bourbon and what should I try? I am a, so I'm a bullet mm -hmm. drinker. Um, bullet to me is a nice mid-priced bourbon. It's not too sweet. It's not too, not too much rye kind of mellow, a little spicy. It kind of depends on what your tastes are and whether you're going to be mixing it or not. But for me, Bullet is like that. I can drink it straight or I don't feel too bad mixing it because it's not ridiculously expensive. Um, I, I, but, but bourbon is, is like very personal, mm -hmm. right? It's what you love, what you taste. But some people like that super spicy rye bite. Some people like the the more vanilla, chocolatey, fruity notes that are a little bit sweeter so i kind of stick in the middle i'm a, I'm a i love some buffalo trace in the in the okay. winter it's what i make my eggnog with is buffalo okay. trace but for the most part i'm a bullet drinker um yeah no <laughs> cool i've tried a lot of bourbons but uh oh if, if you have to go searching for something really good though maker's mark does a wood stave like a limited edition wood stave uh a blend every year and 2020s was just phenomenal okay. i've got a bottle that i'm afraid to open Save because it. if i can't find it anymore <laughs> i'll never have it again that's so. amazing you find something you like and you get it um yeah yeah like eight bottles <laughs> <laughs> um you're you're mentioning how you um really talk about uh bitcoin with uh for your, like your children like for your, their, their future like yep do they also like see it the way you see it or they're like oh, mom you're just talking about bitcoin again so my oldest is 24 he's a he's a full stack developer awesome. he he has been in kind of in the space for a while i've i've seen him use bitcoin and what frustrates him and what i've seen him talk about that frustrates him is is the whole crypto bro i got rich on a on an old coin because i got an early yeah. that frustrates him a little bit um my oldest daughter absolutely sees the value. She's 18. She's in college awesome. now. Um, I'm fairly certain, you know, crypto is a, is a part of her retirement plan and portfolio. My second daughter has actually worked crypto shows. She's, um, she's gotten paid in, in awesome. a couple of cryptos, Bitcoin Dash, a couple of others to, to work at booths for crypto events. Um, she's very thrilled with the, the status of her bags right now. <laughs> Uh, but my youngest is not quite there yet. But but to be fair, she's kind of like um, she's like tech phobic. Uh, I guess, dude. <laughs> Actually, yeah, much. she's uh, so she's fifteen, mm -hmm. and to her, a laptop seems foreign. <laughs> so everything is on her phone. But she has no interest in economics, and no interest in politics, and no interest in finance. 
uh, but they all have crypto wallets and um, they're they're perfectly fine with getting a little crypto dropped in there here, awesome. you know, every now and then for chores or whatever. So they've all had crypto wallets for a really Awesome. Long it's time. good for them. Good that um, you're educating them on yeah. what money is, what value is. Well, absolutely. Yeah. No, well, they're not <laughs> kids. So they, they get, they've gotten lessons in that their good. whole life. Um, all right. So one of my last questions I'd like to ask um what is your favorite wholesome crypto moment? Oh <laughs> okay, I, w- I will tell you. Um, I was actually, I mean, my, my intro to crypto was from my dad. So, oh, that's not, yeah, know, just kind of that whole, we have this thing and my mom couldn't care less. Um, you know, but my dad, like, Hey, this is, this is a thing, you know, but my, my greatest, I think my favorite crypto wholesome moment was when I I took my, uh, 15 year old back in the day, she was 13 and she was like offered the opportunity to learn how to do this. Nice. And then she was like, wait, I'm 13 and I can work this booth and get paid. And, uh, and she was just, you know, just flitting around all of these booths, learning about crypto and, and really just coming back to me, super excited. Dash was her first non-Bitcoin exposure. And she was like, oh my gosh, mom, I remember Dash. listen to me, listen to what you can do with Dash. And it's being accepted in Argentina. And there's all of these restaurants that are taking it and just, you know, just kind of watching, um, Watching people get excited about the possibilities, I think, for me is mm-hmm. I, a bit is I love amazing. that light bulb like over your head moment when I tried to explain oh, yeah, to someone yeah. like how Bitcoin and Ethereum work yeah. or any other crypto. It's it's an amazing feeling. I do too. Yep, I do too. When my friends and family get excited, then I know I've I've done something right. It's beautiful. Um Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining me tonight. I had such a pleasure talking about talking about crypto and learning more about you and what you've done and what you've contributed to this industry. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. See everybody.